Good afternoon. My name is Bill Kennedy. I'm the Vice Chair of Programs at the Global Interdependence Center, and I'll serve as your moderator today. On behalf of the GIC staff and my fellow directors, I welcome each of you to this executive briefing. Today's event is sponsored by the David R. Kotak Global Healthcare Series. As a reminder, donations to the GIC made before December 31st will be matched dollar for dollar through the Kotak Matching Gift Campaign. All proceeds will go towards bringing you new programs next year. I wanna welcome our GIC members, and if you're new to the GIC or new to this program, it's great to have you. The structure will work today. I'm gonna to introduce our guest. He will uh, present for about 20 minutes. Dr. Gellin has a number of slides. These slides will be made available after the call and available on the GIC website. We'll then, uh, after Dr. Gellin's presentation, we'll have a few prepared questions and then we'll move to audience Q&A. If you wish to ask a question, you may do so uh, through the GoToWebinar dashboard on the right-hand side of your screen. Open the questions tab, type your question, hit enter, and that will put into the queue. We have a singular goal over the next 60 minutes. We wanna set the expectations regarding both the vaccine and the vaccination uh, in the fight against COVID-19. We hope to give fact-based information to all of you in the audience so that you can make informed decisions regarding the pandemic's future impact on the economy, the markets, your business, and even your well-being. So now I'm delighted to introduce our special guest. Dr. Bruce Geller is an MD and holds a Master's of Public Health. He's the President, Global Immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Dr. Gellin previously served at the Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health and as the Director of the National Vaccine Program Office. While at HHS, Dr. Gellin was Principal Advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Health on vaccines and immunization programs and policies. Dr. Gellin also represented HHS at, as a technical and policy advisor to the World Health Organization, the WHO, focusing on influenza and vaccine hesitancy. He contributed to the Decade of Vaccines Collaboration, the Global Action Vaccine Action Plan, GVAP, and he's currently a member of the WHO Working Group on Influenza Preparedness and Response. Dr. Gellin earned an MPH in epidemiology from the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's a graduate of Weill Cornell Medical College and was a Moorhead Scholar at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He previously worked at the CDC and the NIH. Dr. Gellin achieved board certification in internal medicine and infectious diseases and serves as a peer reviewer for over a dozen medical journals. So I think you can all understand and appreciate why we're so happy to have Dr. Gellin here today to talk about the vaccine and the vaccination. So Dr. Gellin, thank you very much. Um, maybe to kick off, I know uh, we wanna get right into the slides, but when we think about the pandemic and COVID-19, uh, we can actually look back to history and use history as a guide as to uh, not only where we are, but where we might be going. So maybe you can maybe kick off your conversation with a discussion about the historical parallels between this pandemic and prior pandemics. Sure, Bill, thanks a lot. And thanks for having me to this uh, to this forum. And I, I look forward to getting through this, not to get through it, but to have the, hear, hear from everybody what the questions are. Um, next slide, please. The, the, as Bill said, I think that all that influenza stuff in the introductions, I couldn't avoid this. Um, uh, and I think that probably many of you have either read this or heard about this book by John Barry. When I was in government, it was required reading. Uh, and in fact, it was not only required reading of us, but Secretary Leverett, um, had us underline a one-hour read, and it was distributed to all members of Congress. Um, they could read it all if they wanted, but they had the one-hour read. Uh, and then I won't ask you all, but uh, you know, there's a, there's, I think that if ever there was a year to get a flu vaccine, this is it, to make sure that if there's a, another respiratory infection that you can prevent, you should. Uh, but I think the point is, the next slide, please, um, is that, that part of the lessons, and I think we're starting to see this already, when we look back at, 19, at 1918, if you could go back, Colleen, if we look back at, at 1918, the, the, the influenza pandemic was described in waves. It was a small first wave, 
The second wave was what, what in a very short period of time, um, had its largest impact, and there was a third wave. And what was going on there was really about, and I think the, those waves dampened out when there was broader population immunity and the virus had fewer places to go. So that's a general principle. Um, because we're not in Philadelphia, if I'd done this with you in Philadelphia, I would tell you about how Philadelphia was the hardest hit of any city in 1918. You can read about that in John Barry's book. Next slide, uh, advance it, please. So we think about what lessons we have from here. Nobody's got a crystal ball. It's particularly a crystal ball with the coronavirus in the middle of it. The next slide. But there's a piece in nature that at least you should beware, beware of. Next, the advance again. That, that tried to predict this. And again, what's behind this is the immunity that you would get, um, in this case, from, from uh, either disease or from a vaccine. And it's that immunity. It's, it's, and we'll get to it a little bit later. The sort of population is called herd immunity. And the concept is that when, when a virus is, infects a number of people, it leaves them with some protection, some immune protection, so that they can't get reinfected, um, either immediately or for some period of time. And without getting into the details of these different, different theories, these are different models, are depending on how things play out, depending on the duration of immunity, depending on how broadly it affects the community, we could see different waves. I think to your point, Bill, as far as setting expectations, I think that we have to be prepared to be living with this virus for some time to come. Um, maybe we'll, maybe there'll be some magic that it goes away, um, but I think that we need to be prepared, prepared that it's going to be part of us in the same way that after 1918, influenza became part of seasonal influenza. We've learned to, 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 to manage that even without vaccines early on, but it was, a it was a different virus. But I think the general principle is the same that we need to, well, while there's a lot of hope that the vaccine is going to change things, I think we're going to have to see how it actually, how they, they actually perform, what impacts they have, and which of these curves uh, is the one that is our future. Next slide. So part of this, again, I'm not, this is not a heavy science talk. Uh, this, the slides are more pictures than anything else. But again, behind this is about immunity. So when we talk about vaccines, that's the point, is can you provide immunity from a vaccines that you might get from a natural infection? Um, an example, probably the, the, that, that, that the theory is that, or that what happens most of the time is that when people are infected, they're left with immunity, so they can't get reinfected. Um, measles is probably the best example. If you survive measles, and you, or if you're vaccinated for measles, you have lifelong protection for the vast majority of people. We, all, we know that influenza is different for a number of reasons. The duration of protection is not as long, uh, and we also know that the virus mutates quite a bit so that, uh, that the immunity you had to either to the previous vaccine or the virus might not capture the, the next, uh, the next uh, virus that comes through. So I think immunity is the basis here. And so some of the questions here, frankly, that we're trying to learn about COVID that we're gonna have to get, in the 10 months it's been around, what we've learned about it is incredible, but, but it raises as many questions as we have answers. We have to understand why some people are protected from disease and others remain healthy? What are we gonna learn from a natural infection? What does that mean for either the vaccine development or for reinfections? We're gonna learn a lot about the vaccines that are coming through, about what kind of immunity they provide. And then this question of herd immunity. When is the population immune so the virus doesn't have people, can't go rippling through a community and doesn't have enough people to infect? Next slide. So with this, it's just this general concept of herd immunity. And I'm going to get into a, 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 a short discussion about this, but here's the general principle. That, that it, it can, in the, if, if you're one of these people in yellow, that means that you have no immunity and the virus can then ripple between, between different people. As there's increasing immunity in the population, that virus has no place to go. I mean, that's the principle of disease eradication. I don't think this is a disease that will be eradicated but that's the principle otherwise. Um, and so maybe not everybody in a community needs to, be in, to, to have immune, immune protection, but if there's broad protection in the community, then it's, there's a lot less disease and a lot less opportunity for outbreaks. Next slide. So with this concept of, of herd immunity, some of you have probably heard about this. And I don't wanna dwell on it, but I thought if we're gonna talk about herd immunity, we should at least raise this. This is the idea of letting the, letting the virus do its thing and creating natural immunity, if you will, and protecting those, this idea of forced protection, uh, keeping them out of the way of things. Um, it's a theory, uh, next slide please, but it's only that. And, and I think the question is, could you actually do it? Um, and you see the, the responses from, from um, an op, actually from John Barry, 
about the, the pieces that aren't told there, what the what the what the uh, fallout is from that. Uh, the head of WHO referred to it as unethical. And Fran next slide. And Francis Collins, I think, appropriately took a took a look at this as well and said this is really not a scientific alternative view. It's more of a political a political view. Um, and and particularly when you think about to achieve population immunity from the virus um, is what we're seeing and what we're see with, from the virus what we're seeing now. Uh, 100,000 cases a day now, um, and we're going to see the ensuing impact on, on, on morbidity and mortality. So I just wanted to at least touch on that. We can discuss it later. Next slide. Um, there's also this question, and I think it has implications for, for both the herd and for vaccination of reinfection, and we're going to have to watch this. So reinfection can occur when, when after you're protected, that immunity wanes. And Despite the, the millions of people who've been vaccinated, who've, who've, who've been uh, infected so far, there are less than 30 documented cases of reinfection. I'm sure there are more, but and we're going to probably see more um, over time as the immunity from the natural infection wanes. But to, but at least for now, um, we're seeing that the that the natural infection pro provides immunity for some period of time. That's obviously important for vaccine development because we're gonna to have to see how long immune protection lasts from a vaccine. One of the problems of the short vaccine clinical trials, you're only observing for a short period of time. So you don't know what happens beyond that observation period. We're gonna to have to learn that in real time when vaccines are available. Next slide. So the general scheme, and I, as, as Bill said, I, I spent a lot of time working on vaccines I mean, from a 50,000 foot perspective, this is, the, this is the way it works. That ideally you have all these things go on, you have the research um, mechanisms that work their way in, into discovery and developing products, they're distributed, there are recommendations for the use, and you can measure the impact on the population. Seems simple. Next slide, please. When we developed a national vaccine plan a decade ago, we took a look at it from a system standpoint. It's a little hard to see this, but the idea is that there are a lot of elements in the system from on the left hand left hand side, sort of the basic discovery and research. The center is sort of the the vaccination program, and then to the right is is what the impacts of that would be. This is a very much of a cartoon. I think the principle is it's not quite a Rube Goldberg diagram, but this is all connected. And these are gear. I think about this as gears and an engine, and they all have to work. And we're going to get into it. We try to think about what this COVID vaccination program is going to look like. It's built largely on the existing vaccination program we have in the United States but it's gonna be complicated for lots of reasons, um, uh, but, and it all has to work. And that's, that's what I think we're gonna be seeing increasingly, while we, there's been a focus on the vaccine part, which we'll get into in a second, increasingly as vaccines available, we'll be watching, watching how it plays out. I hope it doesn't play out like testing does. Um, there's a lot of attention being paid to, vac to the vaccination preparations. We'll talk about that soon. Next, please. So when I think, so this is, again, I think this probably just so you have some understanding of how the vaccine is supposed to work. I think this is the most science we're going to have here. What you see in the upper right-hand corner is the, is the virus. And what's highlighted is the spike protein, the part of the virus that we know gives, gives that stimulates the immune system to protect it. That protein enters the cell. And the idea is if you can keep that protein from entering the cell, that's the immune protection there. But should it not, this virus enters the cell does a number of things and creates new viruses. And that's the, that's the process right there. And that's the, it's, it is understanding that mechanism, which is, which is what is the basis of the vaccine design, which goes back to the kinds of investments that are made way upstream about basic science. Uh, I remember when SARS was the first coronavirus that caused a, a pandemic came through, there were, the NIH just had a few people who were coronavirologists. They were world famous and they've been, they've been fully occupied since then. But it does speak to the importance of investments in some of that basic work. Next slide. I'm not going to get into a lot of this. You've heard we've heard about the number of vaccines. I mean, there there were probably over 200 vaccine ideas that came forward. Anyone who thought they had an approach that would work put themselves in this in the in the race here. The main point of this slide is to demonstrate that there are a lot of different approaches being taken. A lot of times when people think about vaccines, they think about well. It, they, it's, it's a killed vaccine, they inactivated it some way and then, then injected it. Now, just to give you a sense that there's a lot more nuance now and a lot, a lot of new ways to develop vaccines. And the, the, the list on the left without the details are the, are the approaches being taken 
for which we have other vaccine approaches. So that's, we already know there's a pathway for other, other viruses to create vaccines. On the right are some of the newer approaches that are very promising, but there's not the same, same, same track record because they're newer approaches. All of these are in, the, are in their mix now. We've heard a lot about some of these, like the mRNA, mRNA approach and this vectored approaches that, that have been, some have been involved in other vaccines and some is new for vaccines. So this is the, the template for the landscape. We can talk about some of the details, but the good news is there's a, a number of different approaches being taken. And while vaccine development and, the, and product development usually is most things don't work their way through the pipeline, the more shots on goal, the more chance that, that some are gonna get through. Next, next slide, please. So this is the vaccine race we keep, keep hearing about, but I think increasingly, this is what, what, what has been preoccupying us for the summer. Where are we with this? Phase one, phase two, phase three, what's the data? Um, and then when are we gonna, when, when are we gonna have a, a vaccine that we can start to vaccinate with? This, this story is now gonna start to change as these phase three trials, these large trials, 30,000, 40,000, 60,000 person trials are gonna, are gonna finish and take their, take their data to the FDA for, for an assessment of whether or not they, they, they provide the safety and effectiveness um, to be able to warrant it use. So this is where we've been, and we're gonna hear increasingly the, the vaccines as they bubble up through these trials, particularly these large phase three trials, those are the ones that demonstrate safety and effectiveness or efficacy. Those are the ones that will find their way to the FDA. Those are the ones that will find their newspaper into the newspaper. And presumably, many of those will then become part of the vaccination program over time as the data allows. Next slide. Um, this is the current tally. Uh, you know, you can the, the, many places. You know, to do a good job of, of keeping track of these. This is where we are now. And over that summer, you watch those numbers work their way through from these smaller phase one trials to the phase th to the many phase three trials now. Next slide. Just to give you a sense of the speed. I mean, I, mean, I think that this is a contrast of where we are in, the, in, in as far as the the uh, from the time we we identified this virus to had vaccines. Um, develop, in the development cycle comparing to the others. And this is truly historic. I mean, I think this speaks to a lot of the technology, a lot of the preparedness beforehand, uh, the technology that's available. There have been past lessons from other coronaviruses, SARS uh, and then MERS, the Middle Eastern virus that have given us their cousins of this one and gave us some opportunity to at least begin this understanding of vaccine development. Next slide. And this is the operation warp speed. And, and part of the reason it can be so speedy is what I just mentioned. This is built on what we've known before. Next slide. And I think this is some of the details of that. We've known about the spike protein and other coronaviruses. We've under, begun to understand immunity from past, past work, be, be, be it uh, in, in animal work or some of the early vaccine work. There have been these new technology platforms. And importantly, the recognition that you could actually do things faster without cutting corners. Um, to, to collapse the time to developing a vaccine. That's what's concerned a lot of people. I think the, calling something Operation Warp Speed will wonder whether or not you're cutting corners. It looks like that's, for, I, I'm not part of it, but, but from what I can see, it looks like we're using all the same processes to, do the, to, to develop these vaccines. Some of you probably heard that there were a couple of vaccines recently that were put on what's called clinical hold. The clinical trial was, was paused while they looked into a side effect and then they were continued. To me, that says that the systems that look at these things all the time are in place. Nobody's ever heard of the Data Safety Monitoring Board. Now everybody's heard about it. Probably most people don't know about phase one, two, and three trials. Now it's you know dinner time conversation. So this is the, this is the, we're all watching this in, in real time. These are the systems that have been going on all the time. And now we're just seeing how they're how they're handling this. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a graphic of, of the collapse timeline. The, on the top is the way the vaccines are normally developed. On the bottom, the most important part of this is the, the commitment early on to, to start manufacturing at large scale a vaccine long before you have any idea if it's gonna work. Uh, and no company would do that in peacetime, but for this one, the, uh, the investments, and they got a lot of help from the government, but to begin to start the manufacturing process because the last thing you want is to finish these clinical trials, have something you say, oh, we have something, and now we've got to go back and manufacture it. No one's going to tolerate that. And so the hope is that, that, that as these vaccines work their way to the FDA and get an approval, it will be very short, short order after that, that approval 
that they can be available into vaccination programs around the country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and just to give you a sense of this, and this is, a, there was a concept that I'd never heard before, of vaccine nationalism. Um, the concern that that the, the existing, uh, the manufacturing capacity was being gobbled up by the, by the, the developed world uh, and not leaving enough for others. But just to give you a flavor to where the vaccine, the, here are the, some of the companies and where it's ending up. There's a separate conversation we could talk about, about the global response to this, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Bank, and UNICEF and others to ensure that there's that there's going to be vaccine available at the same time that that surface for others and it can be distributed globally. But this is a there's there is not enough capacity so that no one's going to get enough vaccine the first day it's it's avail it's ready. But there that there is a huge ramp up in that capacity. Although if if the goal is to vaccinate everyone on the planet who might want this vaccine, um, it's going to take a while for all that to come through. Next slide, please. And so I want to get into the, I think our key principle is that, again, we've, we've been talking about the vaccine race. It's gotten lots of attention, but the, the understanding that vaccines don't deliver themselves. These are complex programs to get from manufacturer to the patient. The last mile, like always, is the most complicated, but there are a lot of things, those gears in the engine that have to, have to be meshed correctly for all this to happen. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense of this is from the World Health Organization. And what this depicts is how quickly a new vaccine is, is uh, it, once it's launched in a country, how quickly it's used. And the left-hand side of the number of doses. Um, and what this shows is that and these are vaccine introductions in various countries around the world. The, the blue bar on the left was when Gavi, the, it's called the, the Vaccine Alliance, was introduced. And that was an effort to try to accelerate the availability of vaccines that were, or the introduction of vaccines that were available. The black line is, again, this is from the World Health Organization, was the global switch for, on polio, virus, polio vaccines to an injectable vaccine. You can see the commitment and how steep that line is. But contrast it with what's being proposed for COVID. Again, this is a long timeline here, but, but the idea is that in, in this short period of time to vaccinate, um, so many people is going to take a, a heroic effort, uh, but that's what's going on. The kinds of planning in the United States and the, and the kinds of planning around the world, because when that vaccine arrives, the vaccination programs have to start. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so I think one of the things back to the back to the U.S. This is going to have implications elsewhere, but I just want to give you a sense of the complexity, and that complexity is not only the complexity of the system, but on top of the fact that there is um, there are a lot of unknowns. So we still don't know uh, what, which, which vaccines are going to work their way through the pri pipeline. Most of the vaccines require two doses. You need to get the same vaccine for the second dose as you did for the first. Um, the FDA is going to use a new approach to their to, to um, approving this. Some of these vaccines require ultra cold temperatures and not every, every place can handle that. Um, there may be the need for, depending on the products, uh, some might be diluted and uh, reconstituted at the site of delivery. Um, and and, and each, each of these things is the, and the vaccine part. Um, to date, there has not been um, testing in children and pregnant women. We can talk about that later. But I think it's also really important to see how these vaccines work in the populations that they're directed at. That many vaccines don't have the same immune, immune response in older people as they do in, in younger people. And, and understand that's going to be critically important when we think about who is going to be um, towards the front of the line for this vaccine. Then finally, um, the importance of communication and how that's going to have to evolve with which phase we're in. And on top of this background of vaccine hesitancy, and frankly, the skepticism of something called warp speed, and, and, and to try to make sure we have a clear understanding of what these vaccines look like. Right now, the clinical trials have not been, have not, have not been completed, that information has not been available, and we're going to have to see how these vaccines perform um, to, to before before people are going to say, I want to sign up for that. Next slide, please. Um, I've talked about this before. The idea that there's phases in a program in a program, and that's going to that's going to vary depending on what the supply is. And the the planning that that has gone into this is really think about the vaccination program has to have that 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 planning relevant relative to what the supply might be. Early on. Um, the, the, and we'll talk, we'll see this again in some of the other work that's been done as far as outlining 
who gets to be at the front of the line and the, and the criteria that determine that. Next slide, please. Um, let, let's, let's go on. I, I, th I think I want to cover a few other things here. Um, it, leave there. I think that, that's, the, just go back to that last one. I said, so imagine the planning scenario that you're, you're planning, as we thought about with, 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 with um, pandemic preparedness, there'll be a huge demand and how do you allocate that demand and manage and manage what's a relatively short supply? Now we've seen evidence that there's questions about how willing people are going to be to to go stand in line, or whether there's a wait and see attitude. So you can imagine the complexity of these two two planning scenarios: high demand and low demand. Next slide. And, and so from the the Institute of Medicine, uh, the National Academy of Medicine recently put out a framework um, and the principles on which vaccines should be allocated. In this, in this supply constraint setting. And they look at this from the concept of both ethical principles and programmatic principles. You can see these, but I think that the, the overlying concepts of, of maximizing benefit, that there's equal concern uh, for, for dignity, worth, and value of the population. And because of the recognition of the impact that this virus has had on, the, on, 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 on health and, on, and amplified some of the health inequities, attention being paid to that as well. On the programmatic side, uh, again, the importance of data-driven decision-making and there'd be impartial impartiality to that. Probably the most important is the importance of transparency, that people have understanding of how decisions get made. Um, and then um, that the, the basis of this allocation is, is also looking at the risks of disease, the transmission of that disease and the impact of society and the roles that different people have um, in terms of, 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 of those, those features and how that would impact, frankly, where they stand in line. Next slide. And, and these, are, these are the overall goals, obviously. But again, the criteria are looking at both infection, uh, the impacts of that infection, societal impact, and transmission. Next slide. So that, that sets the overall framework. I won't dwell on this, but I think there's one thing you want to take a look at is this, is this is the, the overarching, this is the framework that was put out by the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, the CDC's advisory committee will also try to operationalize this and turn it into a program, but it gives a sense of, of who gets to be, depending on the supply, what, what you know, the, the, the people who would be towards the front of that line. Now, I think an important part of this is what you see is equity is cross-cutting, and that has to apply regardless of which phase the overlay of equity is one of the principles that the uh, that the National Academy of Medicine um, underscored. Next slide, please. So a few things, and I think that that I'd be interested in your your views on this one, given sort of the, the the roles that you play. That an important part of this on the societal functioning is making sure that the critical infrastructure is is allowed to to continue to 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 function. Next slide, please. Um, and with that, this idea of of, an asset of essential workers, um, and you know, it's 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 a it's a complicated um, array of people and sectors. But again, the who's in the critical who's who's an essential worker, and therefore would, would 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 demand some level of protection, and whether the vaccine is is that protection or not. Next slide, please. But I wanted to also sort of highlight this. This is uh, maybe you've seen this one, but this is about wor working from home, and it's a complicated slide. On the left is the is the is the the ascent, the the fractional who are employed in this very various essential industries. On the right is this what's and again this is not my area but uh, but remote labor in the index. Those on the right can work remotely. Those on the left can't. And then you have the wage on the other side. And what you, if you just look at a few of these, from roofers to um, to credit analysts. There's clearly the ability of, of, of protecting yourselves other from a vaccine. This again plays into this as well, as far as how you consider uh, the, that allocation strategy. Next slide. Um, so this is just remember, this is from 15 years ago. So this is not what's going on on CNN right now. But one of the questions that people have is how do, who makes these decisions about this stuff? And so it, when when there was a vaccine shortage in 2004, flu vaccine shortage in 2004. Um, there was a whole, it was, it was a parallel conversation about, about supply and demand and how do you allocate that short supply. So sort of the equivalent of town hall meetings, I'll just leave this to you. You know, when you ask the, ask the public who should decide, uh, next slide please. Um, they took a look at this and again, this is a different era and maybe it's a lot different, 
But again, about who, who people thought, thought that should decide. Clearly, the White House was not the one. But I think the, an important part here is the, the people who do this professionally, both the CDC and state health departments are the one that rose to the top of the list. What this shows is how people change their perspectives when they learn a little bit more about the system. But again, I think this question comes up of, hey, if I'm at this place in line, who, who decided that for me? Next slide, please. Um, now we have to get to something that's more current. So that last slide was 2004, and this is, could be yesterday or tomorrow. But you've all seen things like this. Next slide, please. And now we're in this, that, that, that this is all related. These are all connected. Um, and a recent poll has showed um, the decline in the appetite for vaccination um, and segmented by, by, by the population. But that decline is worrisome. And what that might mean in terms of what people, what, people's interest in being vaccinated there's a lot of it's a wait and see attitude because we don't know the, how these vaccines look right now. But this has been a wake up call as far as uh, the, re the idea that just because you build it doesn't mean they're going to come. And we're going to have to better understand this and try to try to better understand what information from what sources people are going to want to be able to help them make that decision. Next slide, please. And so behind this is, again, uh, this is a global vision of a view of the same thing uh, of uh, green is people who have willingness and red is not. I'll just highlight that China's at the top and Russia's at the bottom and you can fill in all the rest. But this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Um, but it's, a, it's it is, there's a wariness, uh, I think, throughout for, for lots of reasons. And I think it is a wake up call for, for all communities to better understand how this is going to play in their communities. Next slide, please. Um, so there's been a lot. You've, I'm sure you've heard about uh, vaccine hesitancy as an overarching issue. I think that, that this is, a, this is a, a book by Heidi Larson, who's an anthropologist in the London School of Tropical Medicine. And I think that's, that speaks a lot because look at this whole issue from, a, from an anthropological perspective. And this is some of the issues here. A lot of this gets talked about in terms of, of vaccine safety, but equivalent is this question of dignity and distrust um, and, and the power of beliefs over facts and the power of stories over data. And that's what the swirl, the swirl on social media. Next, next slide as well. And we have to better understand understand that. This is a piece that was in Nature that it's a little bit tricky, tricky to understand. But basically, the red dots are the anti-vaccine people, the blue dots are the pro-vaccine people, and the green are the people who are in the middle trying to figure it out. And the the assertion of looking at this over a period of time is that there's a lot of activity in the red dots, the blue dots seem disconnected from the from the from the rest, and the concern is how this chatter might transform into perceptions and then behaviors. Next slide. And so, so with that is this question about misinformation. And here are just two pieces that are worth just highlighting, and there are many like this. And how do you correct misinformation? How do people uh, factor that into their decision-making? You just click the next two. It just highlights what this is about, these mis misinformation on social media. Colleen, just click, please. Um, that, that, that the, first, the study on the left was found that up to 20% of the respondents were somewhat misinformed about vaccines. And the right was this totally made up story, uh, click again, that seven children in Senegal were killed by a fake coronavirus vaccine. None of that story is true, but there it gets out and it becomes part of the urban legend. Next slide. And so now again, where we started, and I think this is where Bill set us off about trying to think about our expectations. Um, I'm sure you all recognize Dr. Fauci. This is his Washington Nationals mask, not his NIH mask. Uh, he's got several like that, but I think that he, this is, this is from the summer, but I think it's the same, that, that as the vaccine becomes available, we hope that it's gonna have a, a huge impact on the population, but I think we need to recognize that we're gonna, as I said at the beginning, we're gonna be living with this. We're not gonna eradicate this disease. Only smallpox has been eradicated, polio's on the cusp, and so learning to live with this, and I think that the, the investing in the science to understand how, the, how, how, this, how this vaccine is operating, understanding the epidemiology of the disease, and then overlaying that to, uh, to, to the vaccine on top of the other um, social, social and behavioral aspects to be important to try to be diff a different normal, but I don't think it's gonna be like it was a year ago. Next slide. And then finally to, um, to highlight that the, um, I think the last one's Colleen, is the next slide, um, is that, that, that we mentioned before about, about smallpox. And I think it's in this context, and this is the second to last slide. So this is a 200-year-old, which is probably the equivalent of a political cartoon. What's featured here is 
Dr. Jenner, who some of you may have heard of, who is the who is the one who observed this idea that that scrapings from a cow could protect you against smallpox. That led to a long way later the global eradication of smallpox. But 200 years ago, there was concerns about vaccines. What you'll see is that that, that Dr. Jenner is vaccinating people, and they're starting to look like cows, they're becoming cows, they're breaking out in cows. So this concept of pushing back against the vaccine is not new. But nevertheless, the last slide. So this is just to reinforce that it can have a huge impact. Um, and in the late 70s, there was a declaration that smallpox was gone and the first human, human disease to be eradicated, and it wouldn't have happened without a vaccine. So I'll stop there. That's a broad swath of things. Should give you plenty to, to dig into. So Bill, back to you uh, and over to the questions. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gellin. A fantastic uh, summary and not just 50,000 feet, but maybe uh, 500 feet in some cases, which <laughs> very, very informative. So thank you. So let me ask, um, th there was a headline that said one in three Americans would not get the COVID-19 vaccine. So the question to you, what if warp speed builds it, but no one shows up, or at least a third of the population doesn't show up? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that's that's a real concern, and and I, I guess and, I, and I, I sort of framed it this way. I, I and when I ask when I talk to people who say that, what I like to hear from them is, okay, I, I understand that, but what in what is it about that 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 is an issue? And I, we can talk about that. But more importantly, is what information from what source would help you th rethink that decision? Um, and I think that's going to be an important piece of that. I, I think a piece of that it depends how the question might be framed. Um, I think that a lot of people have a wait and see attitude. This is all new. Um, the virus is new, the vaccine is new, warp speed is fast, the technologies are new. Um, you know, why not you know see what happens to other people? Um, so I think there's a piece of that as well and trying to better understand that. but if if that's one third, then I think that tells you the two thirds would be would be interested in it. and I think capturing that experience is going to be important so that, you know, we'll see how it goes. We don't, we'll see from the clinical trials what its effectiveness is and safety, but presumably when we see how that works in the first X number of people or the healthcare workers or a person line, I would, I would hope that people might rethink that decision when they see what impact it has, hoping that's a good impact. Again, we don't know yet, but that's what we'll have to see. Thank you. So there's a, uh, two questions from audience participants. Uh, they tie together. Do you have an estimate on how many doses are needed for the U.S. population? And how much of an issue is the manufacturing capacity, uh, assuming that one or more of the vaccines going through trials is approved? So um, that's the first one's an easy one because, I mean, the, the simple one is um, everybody would benefit from it unless they have immunity. So we'll have to learn that, but I think that that what we're learning from the from from the disease itself is that immunity to the disease may be limited, but be short 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 term. We'll have to see how that plays out. Um, but therefore, if the vaccine does provide that immune protection, uh, most people I mean people are not protected, uh, and this is the definition of a pandemic is when you have something that transmits effectively between people for which there's no which which everybody is vulnerable. So that that one is. An easy one is you do the math, and if it's a two-dose vaccine, you double it. So that's so so depending on the product, you you know it's going to be 500 to 700 million doses up front. Now we don't know whether or not we're going to require booster shots or down the road, but you know we can't we can't wait to make those decisions. But that's the number up front. Um, and and again, I, I I think we'll we'll hear more about it. I don't have insights into where we are the manufacturing, other than it's all started. Um, and the manufacturers have, for the re reasons that I mentioned before, they got into the manufacturing long before they had any idea that the vaccines would even be this far along. So I don't have numbers for you, but but at least what I'm told is that 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 as these clinical trials complete, um, that that should that th should things that be on track, that vaccine could be available to the broader population, not just those uh, those those up, the upfront phase one A group. Um, maybe by late spring or earlier. That's all, but everything has to go right, and we need to know that the manufacturing is on track. Great, thank you. So there's a long list of stubborn COVID-19 myths. Um, maybe you could uh, 
give us some you know factual information uh, true or false myth or real um I'll, I'll lay out five of them um so the first one is that the the virus virus was engineered in a chinese lab the second one is that covid 19 is no worse than the flu another one is that spikes in cases is just simply a function that we're doing more testing and then uh, any vaccine will be unsafe and it's it's actually better uh, to catch the virus the covid 19 virus as opposed to actually taking the vaccine and the last one was a, a headline that you flagged to me uh, the country of Denmark apparently is going to have to call 17 million mink because uh, they have a mutated form of COVID-19. You just put a little bit of uh, uh, science and perspective around this. Sure, let me start with the last one. You probably have to read them back to me. So the mink thing is, so 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 there are, um, not every species is uh, can be infected by every virus. Um, and we know with coronaviruses, they have affinity to certain certain types of, of, of animals. And this is maybe the mink's an animal model. They're related to ferrets, and for a variety of biological reasons, they are susceptible to this. So this issue that came up, I guess, overnight, we saw in the New York Times about the mink, was that there's a mink colony in Denmark that has a variant of a, cor of a coronavirus. And I think there's enough concern. I don't know how it got there. Um, there was a previous episode of an outbreak in mink in Utah that seemed to have gotten from a person and it spread through the mink. But I think that there's a concern that if there's a number of, uh, if there's a, a density of, of virus that can, 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 um, can potentially infect people, um, you don't want another one flowing into the system. And this is a different, a different one that would be probably one that the current vaccine might not be directed to. It does raise the other issue of really tracking this over time. That to date we've heard we've heard about about mutated viruses. This comes up a lot, and there's a lot of these are RNA viruses that tend to mutate. These are less more stable than than flu vaccines, but they're going to continue to evolve. To date, it doesn't look like that's going to be a problem for vaccines, but we have to keep an eye on that to make sure that the vaccine sort of you know the, the right the right key for the right lock still works. Um, uh, engineer in the lab. I'm not a lab person, but all the people I know who've looked at that said that this is this is Mother Nature, and Mother Nature is a much much more significant bioterrorist than than people in laboratories. I can't speak more to that, but we do know that that these these allegations come up all the time, and the people who look into it say that it's not it's not the case. Uh, as far as not being more significant than the flu, I mean, I we should have had a quiz question. In a, in an average year, if there's such a thing, <laughs> and now it seems like there's not been such a thing, influenza could will there be between you know, 30 and and 80 million people will die of influenza uh, in an average year. So, uh, you know, and you can look at the news and find out what's going on now with this one. So that gives you a sense of it. Um, what's really, the, what the biggest surprise has been and what's, what is driving everybody crazy is that this is a virus that is transmitted by people who are who are both symptomatic and asymptomatic, which makes it, which makes it so particularly difficult. So there are things about it that are similar um, but clearly enough differences that while um, there's a temptation to do our planning based on influenza planning, um, we're going to go down the wrong roads if we if we follow that path entirely. Well, you had a couple of others uh, of more testing. I mean, more I testing. think there are, there are clearly the more you test, the more you're going to see. Um, but I don't think testing puts people in the hospital or puts people in the morgue. And I think if you look at that number, uh, testing is irrelevant. And so this is a fact that the biology of this virus and what it's doing. And then well, the last one, the, the list. vaccine's riskier than the virus itself. Well, the virus itself we talked about. I mean, you've seen you've seen what the virus is doing with compared to flu. And the vaccine, you know, we'll have to see. There's no way that a vaccine is going to be approved if it's if it causes the same morbidity and mortality as the virus. It should, you know, it's nowhere near. I mean, that's part of what the whole process is about. So the fact that they've gotten this far along, I think is good news. There'll be a reveal quite soon when these when the clinical trials have come come, come to completion, and we'll have, we'll be able to see how effective they are. We know what the what the impact of the virus is on humans. Thank you. All right. So, audience questions. Uh, several of these you've covered, but um, could you just summarize, based on what you know today, timing for 
the first responders to get the vaccine, um, and then the prioritization as it as you think it might be rolled out into 2021, maybe first quarter, second quarter, second half of next year. You know, so so uh, well, and then the other piece of that is there are other vaccines in the pipeline. So I think that that we we focus primarily on the ones that that have been promoted by warp speed, and a number of them you've seen are in are in phase three clinical trials and various places. That's going to dictate what what happens. And my assumption is that for each of those that is far along in clinical trials, there is um, going to be enough supply to reach that first phase. Um, and I think that's going to be the, a critical piece of that. When that happens is hard hard to know. Um, but people speculate on all kinds of dates from the end of the year to early part of next year. And I think that part of that depends on on, on the up the full scale manufacturing when we get into that larger phases. But I think we can start to look look to that too. Like I said, I, I'm guessing um, that we'll start to see more vaccine available by the spring. Thank you. There have been mixed reports about the uh, remdesivir. Uh, do, should we have a view or do you have a view? Uh, is the news positive, negative, neutral for the treatment of COVID-19 patients? I, you know, I thought I'm going to pass on that one because I don't, I don't, I don't know that well enough to have a a view that I want to, <laughs> to to broadcast here, but I will say that that the um, I think we're going to be learning increasing. I think the death rate, the decline in the death rate, speaks to a number of things. I think it's general clinical management because people are now trying to figure this out, and the the clinician conversations the the uh, around the country to try to compare cases and try to understand how best to take care of people. For example, the idea that people do better ventilating if they're prone rather than supine. You know, those are the kind of things where clinical experience means a lot. There are systems for that. I'm also impressed with the medical journals and the newspapers, actually, who are who you know you can get by the paywall <laughs> and read a lot of things that you couldn't otherwise get, and that's keeping everybody a lot more informed, um, both the people you know on, on the front lines and 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 everybody else. Um, but I think the other part of this is learning how to use these how to use these drugs and right the in the right timing. I mean, my just a so from an infectious disease standpoint, there's this is a two-phase illness, really, that there's the virus part of it, and then there's the immune inflammatory part. So simplicity, you know, the drugs that are good for the virus part should be used early, and the drugs that control the inflammatory part might be available a year later. Figuring out precisely what those drugs are and the trade-off, but I think that's what we're starting to see is the improved clinical management. And given the range of things coming through, then, then you know, I think there'll be more products like that. Another part of living with this virus is that just because you're infected doesn't mean you're going to do horribly. Okay, thank you for that. One of our attendees would like to know uh, what criteria will the FDA use in deciding whether a vaccine is worthy of approval? Uh, are there just some thumbnail uh, factors or, or signals that we be we should be looking for uh, in reading this in the media no that that's a great question and i and I, so let me spend a, a little bit more time on that one i mean the fda is obviously pivotal in this process and frankly what has concerned me about some of the politics of this was the fda brand was becoming tarnished uh, because frankly if, if you can't trust the fda to approve products then then what do you i mean they 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 have <laughs> They have reached the 25% of the economy. So if, if you don't think they're going to have impact on products to make sure that they are safe and effective and appropriate, um, that's a bigger problem. And not just for this vaccine, but for the things that they approve. So I'm glad to see that they have, have stood up to their independence. Um, one of the ways they've done that is to provide guidance on what should happen. Another way they've done that is to have these open public meetings of their advisory committee, to have external experts to kick the tires on what the FDA's approach is. It was one of those just a, a week or so ago. Um, and I think that's an important part of the process, largely for the, the why federal advisories commit exist. You have experts who, who basically give advice to the government on what they should be doing, and they don't necessarily agree. Um, and they will bring up things that they're, that is an issue for them that will then factor into the guidance. So the FDA has provided guidance, and they've updated that guidance on precisely that question, on what characteristics they're going to look at. And so they wanted to look at a vaccine that's at least 50% effective um, and then meets standards of safety. The latter is a little bit, I mean, there's not a number for that per se, like there is for vaccine effectiveness, but that's why there's been a that's why the recommendation was to 
lengthen the clinical trials to have a little bit longer observational period for safety. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that, that safety is a part of vaccine development from the beginning all the way through. And once vaccines are evaluated, once, there, once there's a recommendation on the use of vaccine, there's a whole other set of systems, more on the public health side, that monitor vaccine safety. And that's critically important to know. So I think that the FDA is, and, and seeing how the FDA is operating, the fact that they have these meetings in public where everyone has a chance to look at that is, is, is maybe the most important part of all of this. Terrific question, terrific answer. Thank you. So we have a GIC who's looking for clarification. Is the speed in warp speed really a function of the fact that the government's funding the process? They're funding the pharma companies to take the risk off the table for the pharma companies, and that's allowing them to move more quickly uh, than they would otherwise. Yeah, clearly, as I talked about, clearly the manufacturing part did, because there's no way that a company would invest a half a billion dollars on the first day they're going to put a vaccine into a mouse before they have any idea if it's going to do anything. So that's that's been a huge piece of backstopping it. And in normal times, nobody would do that. So I think that's clearly where the government's leverage has been important. Um, although I will say that there are there are companies, an Indian company that, at least in the New York Times, says that in, they're doing it on their own to do some of that ramping up manufacturing. I think recognition of the, the that that manufacturing would otherwise be a choke point and it can't be. I think that the warp speed, you know, again, I, I, I don't know the day-to-day -day operation, but it has a Manhattan Project flavor to it, being run by people on the, both the vaccine side and a guy who's a, who's a four-star general who's the logistics person of how all the pieces fit together. I don't know these people, um, but at least look, from what I can hear is, is they're making sure that, that everything is being looked at to, can we do things as quickly as possible? Um, so I think that's matter. I think what's most important about this is it's a wake-up call to the way we've been doing business. You know, why does it take 15 years to develop a vaccine? Not that you can invest this kind of money for every, every potential product, but I think there's going to be a lot of learning about how we organize at least the vaccine R&D effort to try to make sure that we can, can maximize innovation and shorten timelines to bring products faster. I think that's going to we'll watch this space, but COVID is going to teach us a lot about this. So this ties into the logistics issue. Who will be responsible for the logistics uh, of distribution? And could you speak to the role of the U.S. military, either in trials or in distribution itself? Yeah. So, so I mean, the, among the warp, things that warp speed doesn't do well is communicate. I mean, the idea on the original fact sheet that said that the military is involved in vaccine distribution, I, you know, somehow when I was in government for a long time, that shouldn't have gotten through the clearance process. I think what the what the what the as far as I understand it, what the military is really good at is all these logistics. There are a lot of moving parts. If you're going to have to have a vaccine that goes, it's got to be at this, you know, minus 90 degrees temperature. You got to know how to move it around and make sure when it gets to a place, it's got a place to go at that same. Um, there's a whole infra, IT infrastructure of tracking these products, almost inventory control, but also tracking them to the point of delivery, so you know who got what to make sure that person then has a reminder for getting come back for their second dose, that they got it, and then there's maybe some system to continue to monitor them for effectiveness and safety. So the complexity of all this is quite something. And also because there's so many uncertainties, you have to do you know, simultaneous planning. And I was, it reminded me of algebra one, of multiple simultaneous equation where all you have is variables. Uh, and that's what they're doing. So the military is not gonna be out there in camouflage gear injecting people. I don't think maybe they will on a military base, but they're, as far as I can tell, they're sort of in the in the middle between the availability of vaccine for manufacture and getting it to places. But there's also other systems in place. CDC is, is using other distributors they use all the time. So I think that's what the role of the military is. But frankly, it's been confusing. And that and the fact they have a general in there adds to that confusion. But I, I think that there my sense is that that's helping because of their their keen eye on logistics. As far as who's responsible, that's the what's that? Who will be blamed? Um, so I think that <laughs> so who will be who's responsible is my guess. It's going to be the, the eyes will point to CDC and the manufacturers. I mean, I, that, you know, the, that you can only deliver what you have, and if there's not available of supply, then that shouldn't be the CDC's fault. Um, so it's going to be in there somewhere. But I think CDC has provided guidance on what states need to do. Um, and then, it's, then I think that's where states need to need to also figure out how they're going to manage things. 
as I say that, it's got this flavor of push this off on the states, make it their problem. Um, but I think it's going to be a joint a joint piece of of providing because this is so complex. States states do need that guidance, but they need to figure it out for themselves because who's 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 critical in Nebraska is different than who's critical in New Orleans. So states are going to need to titrate these plans based on what they know about their populations. Um, so it's probably between the two of them as far as that level of responsibility. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be no shortage of finger pointing on this one. Um, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts. It, there will be bumps in the road, and we should anticipate that. And the hope is that they, we can learn from these and pivot and make the system better. But I'm sure that, as I said, I think that this will be in the bright lights once the vaccination part gets going. This will be the largest vaccine program ever in the United States and globally. Um, so there'll be, based on that alone, there'll be a lot of issues. Let me highlight one other thing I think is important. I, I mentioned before about vaccine safety and safety monitoring. An issue that's going to come up, and I think it's worth just, just to anticipate this, is that when you give millions of people a vaccine, um, some of them will have side ups, some of them will have sore arms and all those things. Um, and some of them may have an adverse event that's because of that vaccine. We know in influenza, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurological, um, a, a neurological paralysis, occurs in about one in a million that's attributed to the vaccine. But we also know there's a background rate of Guillain-Barre in the community from a variety of different things. We don't know all that. But, but I think the point is that when you vaccinate millions of people, they're still going to have the same medical problems they were going to have without a vaccine. And so when you think about vaccinating people who are in their 70s, um, and that, those people you know, often have other medical issues. Um, and you're going to see within five minutes, five days, five weeks, things happen. There will be heart attacks and strokes just because that's what's happening in the background. Not to say that vaccines can't cause all those, but I think we need to anticipate, particularly when, when millions of people are being vaccinated, there's going to be some confusion on whether or not vaccine caused those things or whether this was just a, a timing issue uh, and a coincidence, which no one likes that word, but I think we need to understand that. And, and, and having an appreciation for the background rates of diseases in different populations is going to be really important because those background rates are background rates without a vaccine, and they're going to be the same background rates with a vaccine. Great, thank you. Let's see if we can get three more uh, quick ones in. Uh, I understand that COVID-19 is the seventh coronavirus that we've had, and for the prior six, there's been no vaccine. Can you confirm or if that's correct? I forget. I'm not a coronavirologist, so I don't know the exact numbers. There's a, there's there's so the ones that have been that have gotten my attention, <laughs> the ones that caused serious human illness and and, and have p pandemic potential. So in 2004, SARS, and 2000, and I forget, seven or eight, MERS, the Middle Eastern, those are the previous two. Um, and, and then there's others that, you know, the coronaviruses cause colds. There are a lot of other coronaviruses around that infect humans. That number seems about right. So somebody's, somebody is an expert or do their homework or something. But on the latter, there, has been, there was efforts to develop vaccines, both for SARS and MERS. That's part of why we can at least have some appreciation. We're not starting from zero. But it also, we also saw in those that there were some issues that we need to pay attention to. Um, I won't get into the details. Well, let me say there was an issue of something called, um, it's an, like enhanced disease, that people who are immunized, there's the theoretical possibility that you, you could get, that your infection could be worse um, if, you're, if you've been previously immunized. That's theoretical, it's been seen in animals, um, and it's something that's been of concern in the development here but we'll still need to keep an eye on it. But, the, but so vaccines have been developed or, or begun to be developed. And frankly, I think that the, the, the failing, if I will, is that after, I mean, SARS shows up out of nowhere. You know, I said that before, a few coronavirologists now became, you know, marquee speakers at, at science meetings. Um, and there was an effort to develop a vaccine, but SARS went away. And so how far, how far do you push on that? So, okay, that's forgivable. When MERS showed up, this is this one that's related to camels and came out of the Middle East, I think that, that was a wake-up call that we didn't fully wake up on. Because if this is not, this was the second coronavirus that's got pandemic potential. You may remember stories about it working its way to Korea and causing outbreaks in hospitals there. Again, that was well controlled and you could control that because of the, it was a different disease. 
Um, only symptomatic people were spreading it. It was relatively late in their course. So you could find them and sort of wall them off and control it with traditional public health measures. But I think Frank, it was, the, it was the, the failing not to continue to advance coronavirus vaccine development after MERS is why we're where we are now. I mean, the, the speed has been incredible, but had we, continue, had we said, well, if this can happen once, okay. If it happens twice, that's probably not the last time. And that probably should have been the lesson of, of buckling down and trying to think that one through. But you know, from an investment standpoint, you know, you can imagine the congressional hearing of why you're spending billions of dollars on a disease that doesn't exist. So I think there's there's that piece as well. I hope, from my vaccine perspective, this is a wake-up call of this cycle of panic and neglect. Uh, I think there's been a pretty pretty good recognition that the impact that a virus like this can have on society and the economy, uh, and making investments to try to be as much ahead of this as you can would be important. I think what we would agree, and I think that is probably the most important thing we could learn from this episode for the next pandemic, which is probably a when, not a not an if. So, well, Dr. Gellin, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we, we really um, appreciate your sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and, and giving us a sense for both the, the type of vaccine, the timing of the vaccine, and more importantly, or as importantly, how it is going to roll out and the mechanics behind the vaccine vaccination process. Uh, we well, thank you for your time. Thank you for the impressive work uh, you and the Sabin Vaccine Institute are doing, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So, audience, the next GIC event is our annual monetary and trade conference in partnership with the Lebeau College of Business at Drexel University. That's going to take place on November 19th with an all-star list of panelists. Again, that's November 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Please don't miss it. To learn more about that conference, to see a replay of today's event, uh, to learn about membership or to donate, please go to our website, which is www.interdependence.org. And as we conclude, we encourage you to take just 60 seconds, please, to fill out our survey. Let us, uh, let us know how we're doing. Your feedback is very important. Uh, we'd like to know how we can improve our programming uh, thank you very much for your attention today and good evening.